thanks for joining us tonight at our Hong Kong Business Relocation to Australia webinar. Uh, my name is Jules Kelly and I'm the Sales and Marketing Manager for the Smarts Group of Companies. Tonight we are joined by Steve Douglas, the Executive Chairman of Smats Group, and Simon De Beer, the Director of Migration Services at Sterling Henry Global Migration. For those of you that aren't aware, Sterling Henry are leaders in providing Australian migration services. Um, they have offices throughout Australia and Hong Kong and they can assist with all your queries uh, to do with migration pathways to Australia and also Australian visas. During the presentation, um, feel free to submit any questions that you have either in the chat room or the Q&A section, or you can email me directly at juliet.net. Um, and if we've got time, we'll answer them at the end of the seminar. Um, so let's kick off. Over to you, Steve. Uh, thanks, Julie. I'm just gonna start up my um, slides. So let's have a look. Uh... Okay, so I just um, reaffirm your welcoming, Julie, and, and also welcome Simon. You know, um, you know, we've had long-term association with Selling Henry, so it's great to be doing another presentation with you. Um, tonight, we're going to cover um, as, as quickly and as sensibly as we can a very detailed topic in regards to Hong Kong business market relocation in Australia. Obviously, very topical at the moment with you know, changes going on. The Australian government's putting out the, the red carpet for Hong Kong citizens that are in Australia and ones that are looking to consider to go there. So we thought we'd try and summarise things for you as best as possible because when you do come from a place like Hong Kong that is tax advantaged, obviously going to somewhere like Australia that has a very poor global tax reputation can be scary um, and getting in is not easy. So hopefully we'll alleviate some of your fears and your concerns and give you some very useful information tonight. Um, as with all seminars, we have to start off with a disclaimer, um, particularly when it comes to tax affairs. Um, it's very, very important that you look at your personal affairs very, very closely with an advisor. So we're always happy to help you out with that. Um, this, this seminar is very much of a general nature. So please don't act solely upon that. Feel free to reach out to us and we'll certainly help you out. I thought we'd start off just by looking at some of the positives and negatives that um, people see through the eyes into Australia. And of course, you know, um, it's a very unique place. I mean, Australia is uh, but there's an emerging first world. I mean, Many people like to claim that it's already first world, but I don't think it is yet. And the only reason I say that is because we only have 25 million people. So it's very hard to be a, a dominant country with 25 million people, but we do have a very strong population growth. So we're getting up there very, very fast. And we do have very stable and sensible governance. Sometimes that can go against us. We have a political system that basically you know, runs on a two or 3% movement at each election that can swing government and put the next place, next uh, party into power. But we do have two parties that are, are very, very sensible and tend to get things moving regardless of who's in charge. And largely um, that happens because we are very resource rich, not just in minerals, but farmlands. We've got great people. You know, we've got everything that anyone could possibly ask. I don't think there's any resource on the planet that doesn't exist in some way or form in Australia and usually in abundance. Things like iron ore right now is you know, covering up a lot of the weaknesses caused by COVID. Um, we've certainly got space and space is becoming more in demand in the world as we go along. You know, our economy is not dominant on any one sector. We've got you know, significant strengths across many areas, including the good old fashioned ones of tourism and students, which are currently being you know, savage, you know, globally. But again, Australia is not unique in that. It's, you know, COVID is certainly having an impact. It'll bounce back quite quickly, I think, because Australia has proven to be a very successful operator in the COVID environment. You know, I think uh, apart from a second wave going through Melbourne right now, um, you know, we've been able to manage COVID better than anywhere else. And in truth, even the second wave through Melbourne is still by global standards, extremely low and ineffective. Um, one of the things that we do have is a very dominant middle class, and, and that's, you know, one of the, the secrets to our success in Australia. You know, um, we're very much lifting everybody into, you know, the higher ground, um, and that's, you know, giving spending power and everything. We, we actually have the highest, you know, average weekly earnings in the world, which if you're an employee is fantastic, you know, and that's meaning that everybody has an incredible standard of life in Australia, and our support structures a very, very strong, you know, we have a very, very, you know, um, relaxed environment. We want to make sure that everybody, if they have hardship, has support. And of course, from a, an integrity market, there's probably none too much better than Australia. We've um, got extremely low, if not no, some would argue corruption. You know, we have, you know, very open things. The, the media is on the government's tail 
detail all the time to ensure that it works well and it responds to criticism as opposed to suppresses it, which is you know, a, a very good thing from an individual's perspective. Some of the negatives that people consider is obviously taxation. We have a very poor reputation for tax. Hopefully I'll you know, change your view on that a little bit later on because it has gone through trans, uh, dramatic transaction which transition in the last 10, 20 years to be a much more competitive globally standard and continuing to do so. Obviously the, the um, flip side of having the world's highest average weekly earnings being a good thing is the downside in terms of employee costs. And of course we don't have low cost labor in Australia. The minimum weekly wage is over $20 Australian per hour. You know, we have very strong labor laws that ensure that you cannot abuse your employee. You know, if you try to, they have incredible powers of recourse. So there's no way that you can get away with things. We've seen in recent times, some employers that have un underpaid staff for overtime and things like that. And it eventually comes and bites you on the butt and you have to refund it. It's publicly shamed in Australia. So there's no way to get around it. A remoteness is somewhat of a, a negative, uh, mainly because of the high cost of freight and moving things around. Um, but you can see in a time like COVID, that negative becomes a positive because our remoteness has allowed us to, to manage things. As I mentioned, we have a small market in terms of population, but we're obviously on the fringe of every other large market in the region, in Asia in particular. So, you know, some of these negatives, you know, turn into positives in an indirect fashion. We very much have democratic socialist principles, and, and I, for one, am happy with that. And it just means that, like I say, everyone in need gets help. Everybody is considered equal. Everybody, you know, has, has equal opportunity. And that's a fantastic thing. So some places would consider those to be negative. I consider those to be positive, but I get a lot of feedback. People think, oh, that's not quite right. Believe me, if you were on the other side of the, the fence, you'd be happy that was the case. And our consumer and environmental protectionism is right up there as some of the best in the world. Yeah, but the one thing that will frustrate many people moving to Australia for business is that it is a very slow and expensive activity center. You know, to get things done can be a nightmare and the cost compared to what you'd be used to, particularly in Asia, can be extremely frustrating. But you just have to absorb that. You don't have any choice. You know, if you shop around, you'll find that everybody has similar sort of prices. Now, all of those things that are negatives actually create a very safe and sensible economy you know, that is usually growing. We've had over 25 years of continuous GDP growth in Australia. This is the first time we've gone into a recession in over 25 years. That's quite an incredible record. And again, we only went into a recessionary period because of COVID closing down the entire world. Our budget has been blown out. Our economy has slowed down dramatically and gone into negative growth. But by comparison to almost every other place on the planet, we're still looking in pretty good shape. So in that regards, some of those negatives are protective measures. They're frustrating for business, but they're great in terms of client pool, stability and consistency. So not everything bad is totally bad. So you have to learn to adapt and uh, embrace those things because you cannot change it. It is not going to respect you regardless of how big your checkbook is and how dominant you want to be. You have to abide by the rules in Australia, no matter what. So that's Australia in a snapshot from a business perspective. I'm going to hand over to Simon, who's just going to talk about some of the ways you can get into Australia through visa options. So I'll pass over to you, Simon. Thanks, Steve, very much. Uh, for those who haven't met me at, in another of the webinars last week, my name is Simon Devere, and I'm the director of the migration team at Sterling Henry Global Migration. And Sterling Henry Global Migration has been partnering with SMATS for many years now providing migration services to SMATS clients. And uh, this is a great opportunity, these webinars, to touch base with SMATS clients, and we hope the information we provide is useful to you. On the screen in front of you, you've got really the key, um, the key permanent visas that are available to, uh, to overseas nationals who are seeking to come to Australia. Each of these visas can be applied for both in Australia and overseas. So whether you are living, say, in Hong Kong or somewhere else in Asia, or you are actually already relocated to Australia, you could apply for one of these permanent visas. The first one, the skilled visa, just quickly, is really for young, highly skilled people under the age of 45 
There's a points test which determines what their um, employability is. And it's really a common visa for people at an early stage of their career who are highly skilled, have had their skills approved, and um, you know, have good English and are young. The, the next three visas on the list, or the next four visas on the list, are all parts of the same business innovation investor visa. And they are four different parts of the same visa. They're called streams. So the first stream is business innovation for those people with business skills and who own their existing business. The next two are the investor visas for those who have um, either 5 million or 15 million in compliant investment uh, Australian dollars available for transfer to Australia. And the third one is for the, uh, the fourth one I should say is for entrepreneurs who are looking to um, start up their business and have the support of the Australian startup industry sector. So all four of those come under the category called 188, which is for business innovation and investor visas. The last one there uh, is a small program. It's called the Global Talent Visa. There are two parts, there are two types of visas. There's the independent visa for, uh, for highly skilled um, people who are looking to move without a sponsor. And there are also those that wish to be employer sponsored. And if you were in a situation where you had an employer or if you had a national body that could uh, support your application, you could, um, you could proceed with the global talent visa. And it really is a special new visa, which is designed to attract the most highly skilled individuals um, in their field often with a doctorate, um, or if not with a doctorate, then certainly a master's degree and a, uh, a, high, uh, a high reputation in their field. So those four, those five, six categories that we've outlined there are really the key categories for independent migration to Australia. There are some other categories for people who are already employed by an Australian business and were you to be in that situation where you were working for an Australian business, we could always give you advice about the employer nominated options as well, if that was something you were interested in. Steve, if we could just go to the next screen. So as we were discussing uh, the webinar this afternoon, we felt that it was important or this evening, we felt that it was important to make a couple of points about visa considerations. Um, visas are really only one part and Steve will go on and talk about the other important parts but it is important as we say in this slide to bear in mind that visas are neither instant nor guaranteed and they often can take a long time to be processed so that's important to bear in mind as you consider the timing of your move to Australia it's worth having a contingency plan in place for example if you are seeking to sponsor an employee and that employee's visa has either been delayed or declined and you would might want to think about how you would manage that also for those who are going to australia and applying for visas it's important to bear in mind that family members uh, are usually eligible for visas and nonetheless it's important to consider those family members because if you don't and one of the family members has been delayed or even worst case scenario had their visa application declined, how would that affect the employee's decision to relocate to Australia? And it's, that's another factor in, in your contingency planning. Um, the last dot point there is a very important one. Back on the 9th of July, the Australian government announced that there would be they would be making available a range of Hong Kong specific visas. Now there's not very much information known at this stage about these visas. We know that the government has extended the, the visas of temporary skill shortage workers in Australia. These are employed visas, visa holders in Australia. Those visas have all been extended to five years and 
young, young Hong Kong nationals who have been studying in Australia and are working on a post-study work visa have also had their visas or will be having their visas extended to five years as well. And then after that, the government has declared that those visa holders will be given permanent residency. That's what we know so far. We know that the temporary visas and student visa holders in Australia will be on a pathway to permanent residency if they hold a Hong Kong passport. What we don't know is the longer term PR visa pathways that are being considered by the Australian government. And the government has said that they will make those announcements shortly. So if you are interested in staying in touch on the Hong Kong specific visas, please make sure that you give your details to Julie or one of the team at SMATS to ensure that you're able to stay in touch. These new visas have only been uh, announced about six weeks ago, and there's a lot of work being done in government to implement them. And it would be important, I think, if you are interested that you stay in touch. Steve, with that, I might just throw back to you if that's okay. Okay, thanks for that, Simon, appreciate that. I mean, obviously, you know, we've, over many years, we've been going to Hong Kong for over 24 years, and, and not only is there many, many Australians there, but there's many Honkies that, that uh, have always wanted to have Australian, many have PR already, citizenship, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's always something that people have wanted to do. And um, one of the big stumbling blocks uh, apart from obviously getting the visa and permission is obviously the fear of taxation. So we thought particularly from a business angle tonight, we'd look at some of the issues in regards to tax and see if we can you know, deal with the mental implications and give you some information. Now we are dealing particularly with business tonight. So please excuse us uh, for not going into too much personal information, but we do have a, a separate webinar that you can obviously watch on migration tax issues from a personal perspective. So pop on the website for that if you choose. But from a business perspective, I, I suppose, you know, um, Australia is trying very hard to become globally competitive. We've had um, for many, many years a 30% corporate tax rate, and they've just started in the last couple of years reducing that for small to medium sized businesses, and will eventually hope to do it for all businesses. So. The 30% is currently for all major corporations. Smaller businesses are now at about 28 and a half, and that is scheduled to drop down towards 25% over the next few years. Um, you know, again, whether you think that's high or not, you know, it just is what it is. It's just a simple fact of life. Now, one of the things that does, Australia does do very, very well is it ensures that that 25% is fairly dealt with through what we call the franking system. So what happens is with our um, dividends that are distributed to any shareholders, those shareholders get a credit for that 30 or 25% tax paid and only have to bear any tax in their personal name if it is greater than that amount. Now, for many Australian taxpayers, their tax rate is 19 or 32 and a half percent. So what that means is if they're getting dividends, it can basically ensure that they're not paying any additional tax or if they are, it's quite small if their income is sub $180,000 per annum per person at the moment. So what happens is that corporate tax rate, even though it seems high in the face of it, because it passes through to the individual, it could be at a lower rate in the individual hands. In fact, it could end up being zero. So you have to look at that as a planning tool. Again, different to many other countries where the tax is paid and there's no flow on effect, and therefore it's lost never to be recovered. In Australia, it's not impossible to get some of that corporate tax rate back if you are an investor in retirement. So you want to look at that, particularly if it's your business, your company, where it's accumulating those franking credits, they could come back to you in part or in full at a later stage. So bear that in mind. One of the things that will be upsetting to many people coming to Australia is unfortunately you cannot claim entertainment expenses. So that's non-deductible in Australia. Many, many years ago, they took that out. We had an expression that you know, when they did that there was no free lunch. So unfortunately you cannot enjoy entertainment and get a tax deduction for it. It still is a valid corporate expense, but it is not tax deductible. So you have to add it back. Um, you know, if you are a shareholder in a, in a business, you know, you're best off to hold that in your individual or trust name and, and more particularly your trust. Um, and the reason for that is a corporate does not enjoy a half tax free on capital gains whereas individuals and trusts do. So what we would normally be doing is putting the operating business in a corporate structure, 
but the shareholder of that corporate structure for the business would be either the individual or usually more particularly a trust. And that's just going to allow you that if you ever sell the business in the future, you would sell the shares and that would give you a half capital gains tax free status on those shares and, uh, and work out a lot much better for you. A trust gives you even more flexibility where we can distribute to the least tax cost. So you want to consider trust very, very much so in Australia. They're very simple in Australia. They don't have to have very complicated structures. They're cheap to set up usually about $550 plus a few hundred dollars stamp duty, depending on what state. Very cheap to operate. You don't have to have mass trustee fees. There's no need for audit. So you'd normally be encouraged to have a trust as a, a, a shareholding structure. If you are still overseas and you buy a business in Australia, uh, unbelievably, you are capital gains tax free for that period that you remain overseas. Now, we'll talk about later how that, that becomes taxable when you move to Australia. But if you do decide to pre-acquire a business, in readiness for your arrival. And bear in mind, many, many um, migrants take three to four years before they arrive in Australia on a permanent basis and become taxable. This is the way that you can acquire the business, build it up and enjoy that period of growth tax-free until you arrive and then only subsequent profits will be taxable. If it's a small to medium business, there are further CGT incentives where of the remaining half taxable, another half could be subject to tax. So, if it's a, a modest business, you could end up with only paying tax on 25% of your profits at a reduced rate, whatever that might be. So you're 30 to 40% of your reduced you know, quarter taxable amount. So there's some good incentives there, particularly if you realize you know, your, your um, sale you know, and make a capital gain instead of pure income. There are also various startup incentives. They're trying to encourage obviously people to get shares and options you know, to encourage, you know, a larger scale activity. And, and one of the great things in Australia is also that the government is very, very active in helping out people that are creating new, new initiatives. And research and development grants are very, very powerful. You can get up to 43.5% back of the cash that you spend on research and development each year. Now, there's obviously some, you know, strong guidelines in that. It has to be something new. It has to be uh, not just a reinvention of the wheel. But uh, that's certainly something that can be very, very attractive from a startup point of view when you're outlaying significant capital with low or no income during that period. So, you know, that's a very nice fair system. Now, the Australian government on both sides of the parliamentary fence have been very, very active in trying to encourage businesses over the years. You know, so there's usually a lot of government contracts out. There's usually incentives each year for capital expenditure or you know, government you know, uh, approved or, or you know, aims ex ex expenditure. So it's, it's better than you think overall, but you just have to come to terms with, you're gonna be paying that 30 to 25% at corporate level. And then you've got 70 to 60, 75% of either distributable or reinvestable funds. So just get used to it. In terms of planning issues, you know, um, probably the most important thing that I could ever say to anyone is, you know, the number one planning tool is make sure you plan. You know, the biggest mistake people make in Australia is just doing things without checking and then finding out that it has great tax consequence. For example, to get that 50% tax free on capital gains, the only condition is you have to own the asset more than 12 months. So you can imagine how disappointed you'd be if you had made a profit in 11 months and you could have done the transaction in month 13 and got half tax free. But instead, by doing it in month 11, it's a fully taxable transaction. You need to be looking at what you think you'll achieve, what the tax implications would be, and make sure you're always considering it. Whatever you do, check before action. Now, this is a really big culture shift, particularly if people are coming from Asia, where usually the tax implications are so low or none that you just do things and tell your accountant later. You know, in Australia, that is extremely dangerous. The personal income tax rates are as high as 47 cents in the dollar if your income is over $200,000. So if you just thought that it would have little or no tax, you might be unpleasantly surprised to find out that it's a lot bigger tax cost than thought. There's definitely no problem keeping your offshore businesses if you have them. And in fact, a lot of offshore businesses you know, are very beneficial to Australian branches that you might set up with trade, exporting, importing, you know, services, et cetera. 
So don't be worried about having an offshore business. You can certainly keep that. The key is that it must be genuine. Whatever you do, it has to have a genuine office with a genuine staff. The one thing in Australia that you will not be very favorable for you is if you only have a shell company that's an investment holder. There's lots of look through provisions and anti avoidance provisions. So you've got to be very, very careful if you just want to have ownership structures overseas because they will not be able to give you any tax protection, generally speaking. Now, now we also have to look at things like transfer pricing, that if you do have an offshore branch that is going to provide services to the Australian entity, you know, we have to make sure that there's fairness in that charge because obviously it may shift some profits from Australia to the offshore entity. And that is you know, absolutely allowed as long as it is on commercial terms and fair. Now, if that happens to generate a tax benefit because the offshore com company is in a better tax jurisdiction, then that's okay too. So don't worry about that, but we've just got to make sure that it's competitive, realistic and market you know, driven. Now, the other thing you've got to bear in mind is if you do have that offshore business, you're only going to be taxed on you know, profits as they're drawn. So you've got to be very, very mindful if you want to take money out to support your lifestyle in particular, you know, as to when you're going to draw those profits and how you draw those. Anything that is a distribution, you know, could be considered to be a salary, a director's fee, a profit share. They're going to be trapped as taxable in your personal name, even if the business entity is allowed to be left overseas and untaxed generally. So be very, very careful. And when you draw too much income, that's when Australia's tax system really, really hits hard. And the reason is it starts going to a 47 cents in the dollar tax rate on everything above $180,000 currently. Now that is lifting to $200,000 Australian, but that still is not a great amount. So if your income is more than those amounts, you've got to be careful not to voluntarily draw too much because you could be pushing yourself into a very high tax cost. And if you didn't need the money, then you'd be bearing tax when you could have left it in the company, paid a lower corporate rate and had access to the funds to continue to grow and, and build on your business or investment. One of the things that you need to do when you move to Australia is value all of your, your assets. Now, if you have a business that you're going to retain, you need to value that business and get a market value. Uh, particularly if it's got intellectual property that you may or may not be using in Australia under license, you know, but if you've got any assets, Australian businesses, um, offshore property, you know, offshore businesses, anything like that, they become taxable from the time that you permanently relocate to Australia. Up until that point, regardless if you've already got your permanent resident visa, you are not subject to tax on, Austra on worldwide income if you are not living in Australia permanently. Once you do, you become taxable on global income and, and growth, but only on future profits after arrival. And they make that uh, de uh, definition by the value on the day of arrival. So you may have set your business up 20 years ago for $2,000 and you've had great fortune, it's now worth millions. You need to get a value of that millions and only profits above that amount would be subject to tax in Australia. If you own, uh, don't sell it for more than 12 months, those profits would be half tax free potentially too. So you need to look at that. It's very essential that we get a strong valuation from a qualified valuer in whatever relevance it is for the, the asset. You also want to make sure that if you have any corporations or anything to clear out any accumulated earnings before you arrive. Those accumulated earnings would not be subject to tax in Australia if you were distributed them. So make sure you look at that before arriving, anything you receive after arrival could be potentially subject to Australian tax. So you need to make sure that we've tidied things up prior to arrival. Again, planning. Can't emphasize the importance of pre-planning in everything you do. As I mentioned earlier, structures are basically essential in Australia. Having a corporate, you know, what that does allows you to quarantine your tax rate at that current 28 and a half moving to 25 you know, and then decide later how you may deal with the tax if you want to bring it out into your personal name, where you'd want to pull those profits out in a low income year to you, because you may not end up paying much more than the 25 or 32 and a half personal tax rate at that time. So structures give you flexibility and let you manage your affairs in a much more favorable way. 
So they are really, really essential. And again, low cost, easy to operate, very low fees and, and simple. So have no fear in using Australian structures. The one mistake that a lot of people think is that they can hide assets overseas when living in Australia. That is impossible. In the modern age, all the governments have got you know, um, cross information going. They're grabbing tax IDs on every bank account. They're identifying assets all over. You know, you saw just recently even all the Panama files where in allegedly safe havens, governments now have so much power and jurisdiction that they can find out information one way or another. So do not pretend that you can hide things overseas. The truth is they're not taxable in, uh, on past profits anyways. So declaring them, factoring them into the planning makes your life safer and more protected. And you might not be protecting yourself against anything by not declaring because it's only growth in the future that would be subject to tax. You know, you need to establish your residency very clearly because that is the day you become uh, you know, taxable. And as mentioned, your visa is not the catalyst of taxation. So you can rest assured that if you go to Simon, get your visa, have it there um, issued, that is not going to make you taxable in any way, shape or form. What will make you taxable is when you exercise your rights under that visa to permanently relocate to Australia. That is when tax point begins. So just bear that in mind and work your way over a period of time to do that. Once you're in Australia, one of the key things you want to remember is to minimise private debt. Business debt, investment debt is welcomed. It's tax deductible, it's effective, it's profitable. Don't be afraid to have that. But please reduce any private debt when you can. And this is one of the reasons why we'd want you to access any profits in your offshore business. Look at what your salary requirement is. Minimise your private costs so you have a minimum requirement to draw an income from your business so that you can maximise your tax benefits through not needing to extract capital or cash. And probably the, the most important change of thinking when you go down to Australia, which is essential in your tax planning overthought, is understanding that you're not going to Australia as a financial decision. No one in my 25 years of doing this has ever come to me and said, Steve, I'm going to Australia to make my fortune. No one. But people do come to me and say, Steve, I've got my small fortune and Australia is the best place for me to enjoy that. So what happens is it's a very different scenario. It's not there that you're going to go and create. It's tough to build a fortune in Australia. But by golly, there's, there's sums of money that people have just from the sale of a Hong Kong property put you in the higher echelons of wealth in Australia almost instantly. Now, with that comes the opportunity to say, well, should I open a business? Do I keep my overseas business? Is it worthwhile? And believe me, when you look at the entirety of the tax cost versus the cost of your accommodations, the cost of living, the cost of living a higher than expected lifestyle, Australia stacks up extremely well in that regard. So you have to reprogram your mind to understand that it's the entirety, not just the tax implication that is essential to look at. And if you've got some funding to build a business, retain a business overseas and let it grow and prosper cross border or in Australia, then tax will only be a consequence, not a problem to you in the future. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the things to consider. Again, you know, if you've got particular um, issues, we're always happy to help you with them, both from a psychological and a financial. But trust me, if you go to Australia, once you accommodate to the fact that it's hard to get people moving, you're going to enjoy it immensely because you're going back in time to an, an opportunity that you know, is still at a very early point in its global spectrum. So on that note, thank you very much. I'll pass back to Julie. Yeah, and uh, attend to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Simon. Um, both really informative presentations tonight, so I'm sure our guests got a lot out of it. Um, if you would like to be kept up to date with any of the new uh, visa pathways or the business relocation to Australia um, announcements from the Australian government, please be sure to email me at julietstats.net and we'll make sure that uh, we keep you up to date with those um, or if you have any queries or would like to book a free 20 minute consultation um, to discuss tax finance or migration services 
you can email spats at spats.net or you can submit inquiries through to www.smats.net slash inquiries or email myself. Um, but thank you for everyone that has joined us tonight. Thanks again to Steve and Simon for a wonderful presentation. Um, and we'll be emailing out a copy of the webinar very shortly. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. All the best, everybody. Thanks.